September 2nd, 1981, it was a Wednesday. Nathaniel was a young black officer. I think he was 23. The station's trying to raise him. He's not answering the radio. It's a pretty bloody scene. Well, it's another date that'll always stick with me in my life. Is uh, September 2nd, 1981. It was a Wednesday. And uh, <clears throat> that's the day Officer uh, Nathaniel Broom was murdered. And he was riding the Overtown area on day shift. It was in the morning. And uh, he pulls over a vehicle heading the wrong way on a one-way street. <clears throat> and the guy driving the vehicle pulls into a apartment complex. Now we're talking about Overtown, Miami, a uh, black area. This guy's white. Um, they're usually in that area buying dope. And this guy meaning the suspect? The suspect is okay. white. Uh, Nathaniel was a young black officer. I think he was 23. Uh, hadn't been on the department very long at all. I mean, I think he had just finished the FTO program. <clears throat> and the guy bails and runs. Well, Nathaniel bails and runs after him. And he's advising, and then he's not advising anymore. So the station's trying to raise him. He's not answering the radio. Well, I'm coming out of the station, and this is all happening about four blocks north of the station. So I'm heading that way, as are other units, because we have an officer now that can't be found. He's not on his radio anymore. He won't answer his radio. And uh, we get up there, and if I remember, it was uh, Sergeant George Missler who saw Nathaniel lying down behind an old closed um, market, like a small building. And uh, so I hopped the fence, and uh, Richie Bohan was with me from Homicide, and Nathaniel's down. We started immediate mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on him, and uh, rescue's on the way, because now we've we found him. We say we have an officer down, and uh, we're trying CPR. We're trying mouth to mouth on Nathaniel, and there's uh, um, is pretty bloody. Um, it's pretty bloody scene, and uh, <clears throat> so Nathaniel was dead. He didn't make it. And uh, what we didn't know at the time while we were giving him mouth to mouth was that the first shot he took went straight into his heart and killed him. And the offender was uh, Robert Patton, and he was down there in Overtown to buy drugs. And he fled. Uh, thank goodness he was caught the next day. Um, this is 1981. He was sentenced to death. And he died in prison from cancer in 2014. So what are we talking, 33 years later? And uh, Nathaniel was a single young guy, only had his mom. I think he had a sister. Um, uh, it was, But Nathaniel had a vest, but he had it in his locker. And... Um, that's nor here nor there, to be honest with you. But, uh, yeah, we lost a good young officer that day. That'll uh, always be a sad point in my life that day in that career. I think it goes without saying that that's obviously, for anyone who even just listening to that, uh, be a considerable turning point in your career. Uh, because I think one of the things that happens after that and after you know, all the other shootings and incidents you've been on where officers are getting shot at, getting shot, getting killed in the line of duty, um, you started to realize, well, how are we taking care of these officers posthumously? I don't know if I said that correctly, but after they die. How are we taking care of their families and their children? Not a lot was really uh, properly set up to to even just bury these officers properly. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, how how things changed there? Yeah, when, when Nathaniel was killed, 
<clears throat> I was asked to be a pallbearer because of my involvement with trying to save him. And I was glad to be a pallbearer. Um, and I kind of left that day and I, I, uh, other than being sad, I really didn't think much about it, I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> now, fast forward a number of years and, uh, um, we have an officer, Victor Estefan, that gets killed in line of duty on a traffic stop. And, of course, massive funeral, massive attendees, attendance at, the, at Vic's funeral. But I noticed something. It was kind of the friends helping the family and doing this. And, oh, did so-and-so put the funeral? And but There was no concerted plan with the funeral. So I went to the chief and I said, you know, when we lose an officer, I recommend we need somebody that's going to be the appointed person by the police department to be able to work with that family in whatever their needs might be. For that officer, that person, to get with the Department of Justice in Washington, the state of Florida, for all, any, any and all benefits that are going to come from those resources to that officer's family. And I said to the chief, whether it's sworn or non-sworn, we need that person. And it was Chief Dixon at the time, and he said, I'd like you to take that over. So he said, I want it to be called the Department Benefits Officer. And he put that hat on me as with the other hats I was wearing. I was glad to wear that hat. So I did all my research and put everything together with Department of Justice, State of Florida, even our own city. Because when you lo lose an officer in a line of duty, there's benefits that each one of those three entities and governmental entities have for the families from uh, fi mainly financial, mainly financial. So I start, and then I put a funeral plan together that when we have an officer in the line of duty, the funeral should have these components. All the way down to a rescue squad should be in there. A tow truck should be in there. So if one of the police vehicles breaks down in the procession, it can get towed out of the way quickly. If we put everything in place to from the flyovers, from the 21-gun salute, salute, from the bugle playing taps. So honor that police officer correctly. And <clears throat> so in my career, I put eight funerals together, okay? Um, very sad to do it, but glad to do it at the same time because I knew I was doing it for that officer's honor and for the family he or she left behind. And I also started it in the middle of that, <clears throat> a trust fund called the Educational Trust Fund for Children of Slain Police Officers. And for three years in a row in a big hotel in downtown Miami, I had a gala event. And we raised money at those three galas for those three years. And it was a significant amount of money back in the 1980s. And then I get contacted by the director of public safety department, Fred Taylor. And Fred had heard what I was doing with the trust fund. And so we had a meeting. And in that meeting were two sergeants from Metro-Dade, and that was Sergeant Pam Stevens and Sergeant Ed Stack. And the four of us sat there, and the four of us form formed what is now known as POAT, Police Officers Assistance Trust. So we were the four founding members of that trust. And that trust is just bigger than ever today. I mean, millions have, of dollars have been handed out to officers working in the Dade County area, whether you're federal, state, county, city. If you work in Dade County, you can get benefits from POAT. 
So needless to say, that's something I am tremendously proud of. And you should be. I literally just got an email from POAT last week. When I, you know how a lot of us get involved in POAT is the rides they do twice a year, mm -hmm. attracting yes. thousands of, of both police officers and civilians that come and, and do these uh, beneficial rides, raise money. And you talked to us a little bit about what, what POAT does for uh, these families. <clears throat> we established POAT to be able to assist a police officer uh, and his or her family in a time of need that maybe wasn't covered by the agency they work for, okay? Um, hey, guy gets injured off duty at home in a freak accident or something. Maybe he doesn't have the sick time built up, banked up, and he needs time, you know? We're going to assist him pay his bills till he can get back on his feet. You know, um, same thing with if they have a family member that has a need. Now, it all has to be screened. You fill out an application. You fill out a request form. It gets screened. There were times uh, funds were denied, mm. and rightfully so, because they didn't fit under the format of POAT. But that was very few. Most of the time, it was always within our purview, within our uh, policies we had written. And, uh, oh, yes, just... From what I understand today, there's just been millions upon millions of dollars over the years that have been issued out to help officers and their families. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm pretty proud. Folks, if you like this video, there's plenty more coming your way. This is just a small excerpt from a much bigger podcast. Link will be in the description below. We'll see you over there.